we are starting a journey through the book of Exodus today. And we're going to look at Exodus chapter 1. So if you have your Bibles, Exodus is just the second book of the Bible right after Genesis. Uh, We are starting in chapter 1 there. And I'm going to talk today about living in a hard land. This narrative of Exodus is a a story continued. And this is where we begin in this first chapter of Exodus. And I really feel like the whole chapter, just as I read it, what I got was this impression of what it's like to live in a hard land. Where seemingly for no good reason, life has turned into a huge mess, a huge trial with no real hope of an end. It just seems like this trial is going to go on and on and on. Is there anybody here living in a hard land right now that that describes your life? If it is, and I believe there are a lot of you, We're going to learn something. And I I know what that's like. We all go through those times. I know there have been times in my life where uh, I sat down to do the finances, and just every time I sat down to do them, the the red was more and more. We were more and more in the hole, and it didn't feel like with a young family and with starting a church and just ever felt like we could dig out of how deep we were digging ourselves in. We've had dark times in our lives where, I don't know if you've ever had this kind of a dark time, it feels like the next, like the day after all the stuff hits, you're surprised that the sun came up the next day. It was, I mean, what happened was so wrecking, it felt like the world stopped. And when you recognize that everybody else is going on about their life, it, it's like offensive and hurtful and almost like, how is this possible? When you go through hard times, sometimes it just feels like this, this is not recoverable. This is too far gone. I was thinking this week about one of those moments in our life. Remember uh, in 1994, I got a call from Dana at work. I was working down at Artificial Island at one of the nuclear sites. And uh, we were relatively new parents. We had Kylie, and uh, she was less than a year old. The first pregnancy that we had ended in a miscarriage, which was its own kind of heartache. The next pregnancy with Kylie was just pretty smooth. But this one was several months in, and suddenly the doctor told us, there's a problem. And the problem I remember hearing was something that she might not have kidneys, that she might be born with her spine out of her body, and like the, you know, the, the list just went on, and you just kind of start to zone out. You, you, it starts to sound like Charlie Brown's teacher a little bit in your ear. You just can't, what, what? The, the, this baby is not going to be okay. In that moment, what you recognize is that you don't have control of something that really matters to you. I think that's what a hard land is. Something that seems like a really big and important thing, you have no control. You have no choice about how this is going to turn out. That, to me, is a hard land. Hardship beyond our control with the unknown future and possibilities I don't think I'm going to want. What I'm going to show you today from Exodus chapter 1 is this. We have one choice that brings life in that moment. Believer, if you're a child of God, you have one choice that you can make that will bring life and hope to the hopeless, to the hard land. That choice is whether you will trust God or whether you won't. And I don't say that flippantly. I don't say that in Christianese. I say that is the difference in a hard land. Do you believe God is trustworthy or not? That's what this story is all about. And I think there's a lot of lessons we can learn from it. So we're going to start in Exodus chapter 1. We're going to start with verses 1 through 7. And as as I talk about this, I just want to give you the background because this is actually the continuation of a story. The actual, the first word in Hebrew in the book of Exodus, this is the word and. It's a conjunction. Like, and, I'm, I'm going to keep talking about what we were just talking about, because it t- picks up the narrative of Genesis and keeps going. The, the Jewish nation actually looked at the first five books of the Bible as one large novel. And so to understand where we are here, you have to kind of have a little bit of the context from what happened in Genesis and particularly in Joseph's story. So if you're not familiar with the story of Genesis or it's been a while, I'm just going to give you the the Reader's Digest version of it, okay? In the book of Genesis, God calls a man named Abram 
to be the father of a chosen nation, just one problem. Abraham is really old and his wife is really, really old. The story goes from there, from the impossible promise to the impossible miracle answer because he has a son named Isaac. And then that son has two sons, one named Esau, one named Jacob. And this grandson Jacob is the carrier of the promise. Jacob has 12 sons and in a surprising turn in the people of God's story, most of those sons turn on one of the youngest sons and also the favorite son named Joseph and sell him into slavery in Egypt. The story gets dark for a long time. And then a famine shows up in the land where Jacob and his sons live, a life-threatening famine. And Jacob's kids, Jacob's sons, travel to Egypt and find, surprisingly, Joseph, the one they sold earlier, is now in charge in Egypt. And God has worked this whole plan out from trauma to salvation because that's what God does. The story of Genesis is the story of God who meets us in the middle of the hard place and is at work even when we don't see it to do what no one could imagine and bring salvation that no one saw coming. And so that's where that story is behind this when we pick up in Exodus chapter 1. Read with me verses 1 to 7. It says this. These are the names of the sons of Israel who went to Egypt with Jacob, each with his family, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, and Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. The descendants of Jacob numbered 70 in all, and Joseph was already in Egypt. Now Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation died, but the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful. They multiplied greatly, increased in numbers, and became so numerous that the land was filled with them. So here's what we have. We have the story picking up, coming back to that same, scene, that, that same theme, that God works in danger and suffering to show his love, to show his power to save. And his plan unfolds through Joseph with no one seeing how this could be good, where this would end anywhere other than just heartache and trauma. And then from that, the story turns back to what I would call the unnoticed blessings of God. Because the story starts with two, Abram Abram and Sarai. And then it goes down through a family with 12 sons. And now we have 70 immigrants. And only a few verses later, we have a nation that has been exploding. And the Bible says, Moses writes, that it fills the land of Egypt. Believer, I want you to understand that our humanity limits us. And sometimes this is the reality. God's promises play out in our lives without much fanfare or much notice. Progress in our life can be invisible, but it's still happening. Some of you have been crying out to God to do something. Have you ever considered that he might already be doing something? You just don't know where you're looking. Because I think as this nation grows, they're just kind of like taking it for granted. Moses calls out that they are prospering and being exceedingly fruitful, that basically the promise God made to Abram is coming true. But no one's pointing at it. No one's really noticing it. No one's really, it just kind of takes it for granted. It's kind of happening in the background. And so Moses uses words that say they swarmed the land. When you pray, you probably always pray for God's blessing. You probably don't pray for hard times, do you? God, be good, do good things, help me, prosper me, give me what I need, give me more. We always ask God because we always want God to bless us and give us good, and that's what they experienced. What, What Moses does in doing that is then he sets it up for the next part of the story. The fact that they received good is the problem as the story goes on. So keep going with me. Verse 8 down to verse 14. It says this. Then came a new king to whom Joseph meant nothing, came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, we'll join our enemies, fight against us and leave the country. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor. They built Pithom and Ramses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and worked them ruthlessly. 
They made their lives bitter with harsh labor and brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. And in all their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. God has blessed his people. And we don't read that they're doing anything wrong. They're just going about their business. They're not rebelling against God. They're not living immorally. In fact, they are simply doing well. And the very fact that God is blessing him is the start of this terrible turn of events in their lives. It really is nothing more than betrayal. The, the story of Joseph have, as the background, and Joseph mentioned a few times here, is Joseph, one of these Israelites, one of these Hebrews, saved Egypt. And as payment for that, they were given a place in the land. And so their special treatment or their, their, their welcome into the land was a reflection of what Joseph had done. And now all that changes, seemingly for no good reason. It is a turning of the tables. And if you had asked any of them, why is this happening? Why did we go from just normal people living normal lives to now we are in slavery why did it happen? I don't think anyone would have really had answers. And as the people of God, can you imagine what they did? Do you think they cried out a few times to God? Lord, help us. Remember, we're, we're your people. You promised. What they're recognizing is that hardship shows up and they don't like it. Betrayal has come into their lives. And now they're asking, God, are you watching over us? Are you taking care of us? Do you care? Do you see? Or your promise is done? What happened? We didn't do anything to deserve this. Can you still believe God is trustworthy when hard times show up like that? When you've been betrayed, when it hurts so bad, you feel blindsided and you can't seem to catch your breath. Can you still believe that God is trustworthy? And so it says, then came a new king to whom Joseph meant nothing. Most people believe that what happened here is there were rulers who had come to Egypt and taken over Egypt. They were foreigners. They weren't Egyptians. Uh, in history, we call them the Hyksos. They were foreigners who came, took over Egypt. And when that ruler was in charge, they believed that that is when Joseph showed up and helped them. Years later, the Egyptians pushed those rulers out and Egyptians began to rule again. And so you can understand why they would have this trepidation about foreigners. Foreigners whose population is exploding, who are becoming larger and larger. Now, the Israelites were not responsible for any of that, like, over overlording and foreigners becoming a threat, but they get blamed for it and they pay for it because God is blessing them. All of it comes because God is blessing them. So what is this? Is God a trickster? Is God like practical joker up in heaven? Like, uh, you, want, you want to be blessed? I'll bless you. Watch what happens when I bless you. Is that what happens? Because it can feel like that, can it? And we have questions. We have questions about our faith, and they determine whether our faith is stunted, whether it's choked, or whether it grows. Because when God is blessing his people, it's often seen as a threat by those who live not for that world, but for this world. You see that over and over in Scripture. Uh, David in the courts of Saul, and God is at work in David's life, and Saul wants to kill him. You see that in Paul's life in the New Testament, where Paul is going around spreading the gospel, and he keeps getting uh, death threats and, and beaten and threatened. You didn't see it in the life of Jesus. When Jesus shows up on the scene, and he's doing the work of God, but he is a threat to those who are in charge religiously. So uh, there are a lot of times where those who live for God suffer, and it isn't always easily connected to, I'm suffering for the Lord. Sometimes it just feels like suffering. I doubt very much the Israelites were like, well, we're just glad to suffer for Jesus. You know, we're just glad to suffer for God. They were like, what? This is not fair. This is not right. It shouldn't be like this. We were the people of God, and God promised to take care of us. He promised to make a nation. And so as their eyes are focused on the hardship, the Bible says God keeps fulfilling his promise. 
No matter how they are oppressed, no matter what Pharaoh does, God continues to play out his promise. People of God, I wish we could grab a hold of that. We get our eyes on what seems wrong, what seems unfair, what seems like God is failing us. And because of that, that's exactly where the enemy wants your eyes. Because because of that, we miss out on how God is still fulfilling his promises to us. God, I don't know why you've allowed this disease or this sickness or this trial or this struggle, why you allow people to say that about me or for me to be a reject, for me to be pushed out, for me to fail at things that I've tried. I don't understand it. But have you ever considered that God said, I will never leave you or forsake you? That, that David writes in Psalm 23, even when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will feel no evil because you are with me. God is fulfilling his promise. Even when life is off the rails, he is right there with you. Experience the pain, walking through the trauma, right with you. In this book, as we read through the story of Exodus, this Pharaoh and the other Pharaoh are going to constantly try to fight against and overcome the one true God. I mean, in Egypt, the Pharaoh was a God, so I think he thought, all right, we'll see who's better, me or the, the God of the Israelites. But what we see and what, what Pharaoh learned is that no matter how much pride or power is brought to bear, God always wins. Believers, do we believe that? God always wins. If you are in the middle of a hard land, just write this somewhere. God always wins. And then believe it. No matter the twists and turns and no matter the valleys you go through and no matter how dark it seems, how stuck it seems, how hopeless it seems, God always wins. He chooses when he shows everybody that he always wins, but he, it is no less certain. I think that's something that Christians need to keep front and center more often so that we are not shaken and we are not uncertain no matter who does what. But isn't that what shakes us? Well, what about that person? Well, why did they say that? Well, why did they decide that? Why are they doing this to me? Our eyes get right on people. And once your eyes are on people, you know the experience and I know the experience. It is, where's God? What's going on? I'm not sure about my life. I'm not sure this is going to be okay. Uncertainty. But if I will... Put my eyes back on the one who holds all things and the one who always wins. Jesus said it like this. We can be of good cheer because even though we will have trouble in this world, he has overcome the world. Christians, we've got to get back to holding on to that. Now, one other note I want to mention about this, what I just read to you and, and really this whole chapter Moses, as he writes this, carefully avoids mentioning God almost at all. He mentions him off to the side when he talks about the midwives the next thing, that they feared God. But he doesn't mention God's hand at all. And it is this powerful literary way that he tries to give us, as we read the story, the experience that they had, which was, where are you, God? He's telling us by some of the things that are happening, that God is still at work fulfilling his promise, but he's not mentioning it. He's not directly connecting it. And it brings this thing up in us that it would bring up in them. God, where are you? They were more and more aware of the fact that they were not powerful enough to overcome the problems in their life. The situation made it clear that unless God shows up, this is never going to end. And it seems like God isn't going to show up. But Moses is telling the story to tell them and Moses is telling the story to tell us that God never left. God was at work. And so I'm saying to you today, believer, if you are in the middle of something that is overwhelmingly hard, God never left. If you're saying, where are you, God? He's going to say to you, if you will listen, I'm right here. I'm right here. There are times when it feels like only a miracle would save me. Only a miracle would make any difference. And it feels like God is nowhere to be found. But God is shown to be by Moses that in those moments, God is right there working, even though we can't see it. I'm saying to encourage you today, God is right there working in your life. 
Pharaoh's plan was to make e Egypt see Israel as a threat. All oh, these people are going to come. They're going to join with our enemies. They're going to take us over. So what do they do? They try to control them. They, make, they turn them into slaves. Then they hope that they are going to choke out their growth as a nation. They're going to literally try to work them to death. You got all these words piled up at the end of that. He worked them ruthlessly. He made their lives bitter with harsh labor and all kinds of work in their harsh labor. The Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. It's all these words that pile up to say this was the Egyptians trying to stop what was happening. God was prospering them. God was multiplying them. Egypt said, let's stop that. The plan of Egypt was not a kind plan or a fair plan. It is a plan to overpower because of self-interest. We want control. We want to be the powerful ones. So we will put you in your place. We will tear you down so that we remain powerful and in control. The world operates like that, doesn't it? Some of you at your job, that's the politics of your job, isn't it? Some of you in school, that's the politics at school. Tear somebody down so that I stay the person who is, has the reputation. I'm the person who's in charge. When that happens, that's exactly what was happening here. And what we're, what we're learning, what we're seeing, what we're looking at, for those who follow Jesus, this is exactly the kind of thing that God uses to build his kingdom, to spread his name, to save his people. Here's what I'm saying. While slavery showed up and hardship and unfair showed up in their life, while these, these Egyptians and Pharaoh were actively trying to hurt the Israelites, God was using exactly that for his purpose. And that's the, the, this is the setup to the whole story. But this danger and this suffering, it's not just beside the point. It becomes the point. It becomes the thing that God uses because God is always working on a larger picture than we are seeing. When you're asking God, where are you? God, why haven't you fixed this? I want you to understand God is always working on a larger picture than you're thinking about. Our clock ticks by in, in the right now or the today or the this week. If we think we're really broad-minded, we think about decades, God is seeing millions and billions of years the daily experience for them was loss and oppression, but the long-term arc that they could not see was still moving the nation forward. The harder Pharaoh fought against God, the more inevitable his loss. And the more difficult it became for the Israelites, the closer they were to God's long-standing promise. If life had remained e easy in Egypt, where would Israel have remained? God did not promise them, you'll live in Egypt. He promised them, you will live in a land that I will give you. And so when this hardship shows up with ill intent from people who don't have anything to do with God, they're actually actively fighting against God. This is the miracle of the God we serve. He takes even that and melds it right into his plan. So that the people of God will not stay where he didn't promise them. He won't stay in less than they promised him. They will move forward to the thing that he promised to give them. And he uses ungodly people and wicked ways and harmful intentions to move God's people from the place they would have stayed if everything stayed nice to the place that God wanted. He didn't promise them you will be immigrants in Egypt. He promised them a land to be theirs forever. God is moving, even using Pharaoh's rebellion against God to move his people toward his promise for them. Think about that. What if God is big enough to use even someone's ill intent towards you for his purpose? What if their idea of why doesn't matter? Because your God overcomes. Your God is greater and stronger and bigger. What about that? But while all of that is true, this is certainly not a short story, and it doesn't reveal God's work very quickly. Instead, Pharaoh doubles down on this, and he keeps going. And this story kind of gets a little bit unbelievable. So let me keep going and finish this chapter. It says this, verse 15, The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose name were Shifra and Pua, When you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see that the baby is a boy, kill him. 
but if it's a girl, let her live. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. Then the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, Why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? The midwives answered Pharaoh, Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They are vigorous and give birth before the midwives arrive. So God was kind to the midwives, and pe the people increased and became even more numerous. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. Every Hebrew boy that is born, you must throw in the Nile, but let every girl live. Pharaoh does not see the hand of God. Pharaoh is not one of the people of God, so it makes sense that he doesn't see the hand of God. But the people of God probably found it hard to see the hand of God too. Because Pharaoh decides, I haven't been able to choke out their growth by hard labor, so let's just start outright killing babies. Make sure that the, the forces that they could rise up someday in the future will not be as strong. We will kill the men. And so Pharaoh says, I'm, I know what I'll do. I'll get with these midwives and tell them to kill the babies when they're born. But he's thwarted by a couple of women. <laughs> Interesting. The most powerful man who's trying to fight against God can't even beat some midwives. You know, that should be a clue to what's coming. But human pride is a stubborn thing. And so Pharaoh continues to wrestle against the Creator, and he, he escalates it as high as you can imagine. Kill these baby boys. What can be good about that? Can anything good come out of this order? There's no way this can be good. And certainly in the small sense, there's no way to make sense of that. When people suffer, when people die, when, when, when people are taken from us too quickly, it can't make sense to us. It can't because we're human beings. But the question is not whether it makes sense. For believers, the question is whether we'll still trust God, even though I can't make sense of it. What Exodus shows over and over is that God is a God of the impossible situation. And he often brings us to the end of hope to teach us how to hope and where to hope. To give us a hope that can endure the bumps, the bruises, the catastrophes of life. And to give us power to share that hope with a world that doesn't see past this. Moses, the one writing the story, is about to show up in the story. Deliverance is on its way for the children of Israel. It will take some decades, but deliverance is on its way. But, it, but again, because God does this and because it's how faith needs us to interact, God does it by bringing salvation from a most unexpected place. A baby who is under a death order will not only be saved, but will return to save. The helpless one will be used by the great and powerful God to rescue his people from the superpower of earth. That's just like God, isn't it? See, we keep looking for who's strong enough. How is this going to work out? I don't understand. And God goes, wait, let me just pick the weakest, the most unlikely. Let me, let me do that. Let me get to work on this, the, one of these baby boys that's supposed to die. That's what I'll use. That's exactly what I'll use to save my people. So what lessons can we learn from this? Well, a few. God brings abundance and God brings suffering. He is the same in both. We need to have the same faith in both. He is the same God and when he does bring suffering, he always uses it for eternal purposes. God never wastes suffering. If you are suffering, your pain is a drop in the bucket compared to the good God is doing from it. By faith, you can see that, even if you don't understand how that can possibly be. God brings both, but he's the same God. Second thing, when God is silent, he's still there, and you can still trust him. Sometimes God is silent asking if you trust him. If God feels silent to you right now, I'm saying to you, you can trust him. 
He hasn't gone anywhere. He hasn't forgotten. He hasn't gone to sleep or, or stopped caring about you. He's still right there. He's still at work. His promises are still unfolding in your life even when you can't see them. Third thing, God rules in spite of what you see, God rules. God's plan for your life will play out no matter who does what. Other people can try to bring a horror to your life. Joseph is an example of that. His brothers hated him and sold him into slavery. God accomplished his plan in Joseph's life anyway. A severe famine shows up for the people of God. God accomplishes his plan anyway by bringing redemption through Joseph. Now we see the people of God being put into slavery and there's this plot to kill them. But the story of Exodus is this. God still rules. And you are not foolish to believe that God will come through always. When life or people pour out onto us what is meant to crush us and it feels like it will, God is still accomplishing the lasting good that he wants for us when we trust him. The only question for us